right now I would like to dive right in and uh, introduce uh, our first speaker, or actually, let me uh, ask her to introduce herself. Maria, uh, we'd love to hear a little bit about your background and also about what you and your institution's experience uh, is uh, with the topic of micro-credentials. Thank you, Kana. And uh, good afternoon. Um, so my name is Maria Randa, and I work at the University of Agder in Norway as a senior advisor for external funding for education. So basically, my everyday works uh, everyday work consists of exploring new education initiatives and, and suitable funding sources for them as well. And the reason I'm here today is that a few months ago I got nominated as a task leader for micro credentials in the For Them European University Alliance. And we actually have two leaders named for the task. So in addition to me, the task is also led by Diana Fragata from uh, Johannes Gutenberg Universität Mainz. So hello to Diana in case she's actually listening to this panel discussion. I understood she might. Uh, and in addition to Norway and Germany, the For Them Alliance includes partners from Finland, France, Italy, Latvia, Poland, Romania, and Spain. So, so it's nine different countries and universities in our alliance, and all are then involved in this micro-credential task. And this uh, For Them Micro-Credential Task Force actually met for the very first time two days ago. So as an alliance, we are just starting uh, the work in defining what micro-credentials mean for us, what possibilities they bring, and what challenges we need to overcome when providing them. Uh, the expected outcome of the task is, is an alliance-wide definition and joint standards for micro-credentials, sort of a kind of a 360 understanding of the relevant elements of what a micro-credential is, and that then helps us with the design, crediting, recognition of the micro-credential across partners. And of course, we build upon the European Council recommendation, but um, aim to take a step further from there. Um, we aim to increase basically the flexibility for different kinds of students uh, with the help of micro-credentials. And I assume that several European University alliances have similar plans ahead of them uh, that they're working with. Um, what I want to point out, though, that although for them alliance is just now starting to work with the micro-credential, it doesn't mean that these different nine partner universities in our alliance are just about to start. So there are different maturities. So some institutions in the alliance are already offering micro-credentials, while others are not. And in some countries, there are already national definitions in place for micro-credentials, or such a definition is underway. But in most partner countries, there isn't. Uh, however, none of our partner institutions have this kind of a comprehensive institutional strategy or positioning uh, regarding micro-credential in place. So during this first, pa um, first phases of our task, we will just encourage and support the, all partners with defining their institutional positioning and motivation uh, regarding micro-credentials. And from there then we go to the actual alliance task where we bridge these nine different institutional preferences and ambitions with the council recommendation while taking in consideration the national regulations and frameworks for qualifications and funding and, and so on. And naturally we also try to follow closely what the other alliances are doing, what kind of solutions uh, they are going for. Uh, so I guess um, that's, yeah, that's, that's where we're. That does answer. Uh, that's great background, actually. Mm. Could you say a little bit, actually, about the time frame of this strategy? Because you're saying you're you're starting to develop this now, and I'm just mm. curious, like, for how many years do you plan to mm. set it to begin? With? Yeah, yeah. It's 36 months, the entire task, and I said we've we've just started. Uh, this very first phase, roughly six months or so, is spent with mapping. So we aim to look at what happens outside the alliance. Um, there has been very interesting international events where we've gotten kind of a huge amount of information on what happens in different continents, not just in EU, what, what Australia has been doing. They have a really nice national definition what happens uh, in the US, uh, what private actors are doing, what the university alliances are doing. So we kind of map the external landscape. And then we look at the different national uh, operative frameworks in this mapping phase as well. So when we understand what is doable in these different nine countries, what happens elsewhere in the fall, we start with actual definition with this institutional positioning and combining. And I, and I guess that this whole work at, uh, with, with Alliance is about bridging 
that we need to bridge what happens outside the alliance, the relevant international definitions and recommendations with the ambitions that exist within the alliance. And then the challenge maybe comes from finding the right level of accuracy in there, not to over or underdefine in a way. Yeah, yeah, I can imagine that's a huge issue. Um, I'd be very interested in hearing uh, also from Diana, uh, who's with us as well, Diana Andona. Could you also briefly introduce yourself and explain, go into this topic, um, what your experiences are uh, with micro-credentials, perhaps open digital certificates, uh, which I know that you're very involved with? Indeed, thank you very much, Hannah, and thanks, Maria, for the nice introduction. <laughs> so I'm Diana, I'm coming from uh, Romania. I'm uh, a director of digital education in the Politecnica University of Timisoara, which is a very traditional, more than 100 years old uh, university. Beside this traditional aspect, we've been introducing a sort of micro-credentials for a long time. Uh, looking at different aspects, because I strongly believe that micro-credentials is just a new way of describing in a digital education format, something which we have been doing in education for many, many years, which requires more or less uh, training or short formal courses or any other informal activities, which we validate and recognize through uh, either an assessment, either other sorts of evaluation. So, with the incentiveness of the digital education, which more or less didn't start uh, recently, I believe that the process of the digital education started at least 15 years ago. So back 2008, 2009, when really the impact of the new learning management system of Web 2.0 technologies, of open source technologies have been made available, have created a new opportunity for the university to do this. So back probably in 2015, I just had a look today, we um, released the first digital certificate, which was in fact an open badge. So quite a lot of people are now familiar with open badges, and I consider open badges the first form of the micro certificates uh, for informal learning, because we need to consider that micro certificates in the original form is just a validation of short formal, informal, or any other forms of training or education. So we've been doing that for the last six, seven years. We released until now two levels of, uh, of micro-certificates in that way as a university with our partners, and I'll speak about partners probably later today, about uh, until now, believe it or not, about 25,000 uh, micro-certificates. These are in the form of open badges or micro certificates as digital certificates. Digital certificates because about uh, two or three years ago, just in time for the pandemic, we implemented uh, an open source uh, module which allow us uh, through Moodle to validate and release uh, certificates which then can be imported and moved anywhere around the world. But in the last two years, we've been part of a very large project as uh, one of the early adopters of the European Blockchain Services Infrastructure on short EPSI. And we started and validated how we can really include a digital development of open credentials or digital certificate for four degrees diplomas. So for the diplomas which are released by the Ministry of Education or by university, how you can move them and have them in the digital format, uh, validated through blockchain, blockchain, European blockchain effect services, and uh, moved into the learner's wallet and validated like that. So we had several pilots which we'll be running. We implemented successfully this last summer. Uh, some of our uh, graduates, engineers already, have been able to have on the, into their wallet their full degree with all the credentials, all the data and information, and show that uh, to those where, to other universities, for example, from France and Greece, where they've been going to study masters or do any other short training. So that's one side of the story. 
Uh, and if I can have one 20 seconds more, <laughs> the other side of the story is the Uterus Alliance, as Maria has risen that far with the European Universities Alliances. My university is also part of the UDRES, which is entrepreneurial uh, and innovative uh, university alliances, which is focusing more or less on the entrepreneurial aspects of the alliance into the level of the region. And we established a task force on micro-credentials, which I also lead mm. uh, for about one year and a half ago. Yeah, and yeah. Uh, we'll be, yeah, we've been able to release already the sort micro, the, the uh, uh, first micro-credentials uh, for the eye-leading labs, but, uh, which we are running there for our students. But I'll come back to this later. Thank you very much, Diana. And I mean, it's a great measurement of success, to, uh, what you're saying about people already using these digital credentials, having them in their wallets. And we'd love to hear a bit more about that in a little while. But let me first uh, move on also to uh, our third speaker with us today, Martina. It would be great if you could also briefly introduce yourself. And I'd be in particular be curious, knowing a bit about what your organization does, um, what your view is on how perhaps universities can make sure that what credentials they offer or what kind of programs they offer how these could be actually aligned with the needs of the learners and the job market, for instance. Yes, thank you, Hannah. So, yeah, I'm working with a small team in the Knowledge Innovation Center. We just came out of organizing a summit on micro-credentials, uh, where we had, among others, a masterclass, and we had the European Digital Education Hub uh, workshops there. Um, uh, one of the main outputs of it was a declaration on how to improve the flexibility and responsiveness of education systems. That is where micro-credentials is so critical, especially in today's time when our understanding of where learning can take place and how learning can take place is being continuously challenged. Uh, we're involved with a number of projects, yes, with higher education institutions, universities, and vocational education training institutions to develop micro-credential course catalogs, institutional strategies, and policy guidelines. And um, ultimately trying to share and build this knowledge together with European Digital Education Hub working groups is uh, also another element of our work. But in terms of what you, your, your question, Hannah, um, as to how can universities ensure that their programs and, and, and micro-credentials align with the needs of learners, quite frankly, to ask them. Um, beyond just, yes, it's of course important to, to research and analyze uh, labor markets to see the trends and, and identifying emerging skill, skills gaps and developing micro-credentials that respond to those. We need to attract also learners and we need to ensure that uh, the relevance towards the labor market is continuously evolved through our micro-credentials. So it's, it's important to have as I said, feedback mechanisms where you are asking employers, continuously asking employers and learners and other stakeholders to come in and form part of this discussion uh, as to how can we continue increasing the relevance of our, our micro-credentials, taking into account that you're trying to reach a wider group of learners, learners who have been perhaps in the workforce for a very long time, and therefore as well the way of teaching uh, needs to evolve to, to respond to that. Thank you, um, Martina. I was just about to write in the chat that I'd be actually very curious to hear from um, our participants here and also our audience, how would they be continuously gathering this kind of feedback from um, all the stakeholders involved? So please feel free to post in the chat how uh, you are actually finding out this information or are you, uh, you or your organization are in touch with stakeholders? We'd be curious to hear from you about that. Um, so learners are, of course, in great focus here uh, with us. So to, to go a bit deeper into that first, uh, I'll ask you again, Martina, here, what do you think might be needed maybe from the policymaking side to support universities in how they can offer micro-credentials to students? Because you're talking about the European uh, recommendation, and I know that you have a great picture of this policy field. Where are we in that respect? Sorry, I had myself muted. Um, so I will be a little bit cheeky as well with the question that 
rather than just policy as well, uh, I would really point towards the need for investment. Investment in terms of digital technologies, investment in terms of counseling and guidance, and where there's public education uh, institutions involved, the working conditions as well for, for, for the staff there. So that would be my main priority as to what I think is really needed to support universities to offer micro-credentials. But uh, let's go to the policymaking aspect. The council recommendation is quite frankly more than enough to in ensuring that micro-credentials are designed and issued with common principles and elements without being restrictive as to the diversity of micro-credentials that you can have but rather how you are packaging them in a common lexicon that also uh, employers can understand, for, uh, further education institutions can, can understand equally the value and the trust that is necessary to put into these micro-credentials. So from the policymaking aspect, it's just about enabling frameworks and legislation to help this trust building uh, in terms of the value. So uh, to, to what are the learning outcomes of the micro-credentials? How are you describing the micro-credentials in a way that is equally understood by the education sector and by the employment sector? And one of the biggest gaps is employers understanding the skills that uh, learners are having through these micro-credentials. But then, as I said, if an employer doesn't have the digital infrastructure to verify a micro-credential, they are most likely not going to take this uh, into account. So the element of investment, as well for learners to understand themselves what are the micro-credentials that they want for counselling and guidance, is as equally uh, important too. Yes, I totally agree. And I see the others nodding as well. And so talking about the learners, um, Maria, in your strategy development uh, with the Alliance, um, I think a lot is uh, discussed on different types of learners that might be, let's say, the users of micro-credentials. Mm -hmm. I was wondering, do you take into consideration in your new strategy um, how to best ensure that micro-credentials will be accessible and also affordable for learners mm. from diverse backgrounds? Is this something that you are having a special focus on? Mm. Yes, this, this will be definitely a topic to address. Can I just briefly comment what, what Martina just said, just as a, as a quick response with the work-life uh, work relevance of, of, of micro-credentials, that I, I kind of feel that this is not a micro-credential specific thing. That that universities needs and, and higher education institutions generally they need to stay in close contact with work life with the surrounding region to to embed work life relevance in all studies. But the difference with micro credentials is that it offers kind of a fast track for responding, a faster track nonetheless uh, for responding to those needs than larger credentials do. So I kind of I really like the fact that we're discussing work life relevance here, but I don't I I, I kind of would see that as a larger larger thing that we just bind here as a more effective tool. But this, this just as a short comment. And, and to the accessibility and affordability, um, the task description uh, for micro-credentials in the For Them Alliance uh, ends like this. I'm just going to read a direct quote. Um, Enable students to, deliver, uh, to develop their own flexible learning path. So the underlying idea here is to facilitate learning pathways exactly for different kinds of learners. Degree students, non-degree students, working students, disadvantaged students, dropouts, and so on. So accessibility is ensured uh, through designing the studies to be as flexible as possible, easy to enroll, to be taken at the time and pace that suits the learner, and so on. So flexibility in, in terms of scope and time and location and an assessment method are the concrete to make the, make the studies more attainable. But the question about affordability is, is then another one. Um, a more challenging one, maybe. Uh, and for them, as an alliance, consists of publicly funded universities. That tends to be kind of the rule across uh, Europe. So we do not make profit with our education activities. As publicly funded institutions, we, of course, make the micro-credential as affordable as possible for the learner, either entirely free of charge or for the students uh, with the lowest possible participation cost. And how this is ensured is through alignment to national funding system. Or if the, if the national funding system does not recognize these kind of independent, uh, shorter courses, external funding may be utilized, although that adds to a workload. 
Uh, but for example, Norway is just now changing the national funding system for universities so that universities get primar primarily rewarded uh, by the amount of study points completed at the university and not, not longer based on completed degrees. That has been the case so far. So the national funding system in this way contributes uh, to strengthening the university's capacity, financial capacity to shorten credentials, to, to offer shorter uh, studies. But this being said, of course, the different partner institutions operate under different national funding systems and, and some systems are more adaptable uh, to different kinds of or sizes of studies. Um, but if it's not, then, then the universities face larger pressures in putting more cost to the participation part or participant fees. What I found interesting from the recent OECD paper, if I may uh, refer to that one, that um, talked about the benefits and affordability of micro-credentials to different user groups. There it was mentioned that the, uh, the folks that actually benefit most from micro-credentials uh, are those that already possess a university level degree, that they are the ones that have a higher education degree and they may already be at work. And these are actually the folks that can afford to pay, typically. Not all, but, but it gives a certain expectation. So I've, I've kind of... Uh, played a bit ball, uh, with my thoughts here that what would be the kind of right target group or would there be any sector specific orientations here that we could talk about nationally? Um, meaning that if we know, for example, that higher education sector could primarily serve learners that have these prior higher degrees and the learning design is embedded for folks with more independent study skills, where, for example, vet providers, maybe they could design uh, their micro-credentials in a way that can more or better serve the folks that don't have a prior degree uh, are, are from backgrounds where these kind of skills for um, studying independently, putting the knowledge that you get in small modules in a larger framework. Um, so that might be one, one way to look at it. That's very interesting, Maria. Thank you. And I mean, targeting the different types of micro-credentials towards different types of users I can hear is, is a real challenge. Um, I mean, anything that you might like to respond to, Diana, since you're also working for an alliance uh, perspective, that would be very interesting. But then, uh, in addition, I'd be also very curious to hear from you, actually, something about perhaps the partnerships or types of collaborations that your institution has formed over the past years to support the development of micro-credentials. Yes, definitely. And uh, I would like to pick up from where Maria has left it and say that it's clearly the micro-credentials is something really big in terms of digital education, especially in terms of digital education. And it can be delivered in different formats or in different uh, modalities. And probably we need to focus when we are discussing in, in micro-credentials, as with probably with everything in digital education, on three or four aspects. One is the vision and the organizational structure and, and capacity. So that's, that's quite clearly that for a lot of the either university alliances or universities or as a whole European Union, and let make, let's make it like that because United States, Australia has been doing this uh, quite seriously for some time now, uh, having uh, this open mark, education market really available and not probably so much public funded as it is in, in Europe, in European Union especially. Mm -hmm. And then we are looking at the technical development. So the technical development is something which somehow in some part was a bit ahead of the organization or a bit ahead of the development, but it hasn't been fully implemented for everybody because to be able to use the technical development of today, of the 21st century, you need to have very good digital competencies. Mm -hmm. So besides of being different types of learners and different education market, you have different levels of the digital competencies of the learners and sometimes also of the institutions which are delivering the educational certificates because not all of them are fully uh, embracing the digital transformation or fully on the path to digital transformation. So that's the other side of the story. And I always like to say is the evidence effect. You really need to prove through evidence 
and through a real working uh, either user cases or scenarios or real large scale pilots that it's working or not. And that's exactly what also Martina and Maria has said. There are so many projects in the last five, six years which try to showcase the success mm -hmm. of some of the, the stories and also the huge problems which you encounter. I remember many years ago when we started with open badges or when we had a very successful, even consider a best practice uh, project, the open virtual mobility of the digital culture courses where we issued micro certificates and, and, uh, and certificates which we put even stackable and we tried to showcase them. And then the market asked the learner to come with the printed certificate, not with the digital version of the certificate. And then we needed to really educate and, and send uh, guidelines and information to the companies which were employing these people which have been doing this open online courses, these MOOCs, and uh, get these certificates that, yes, they're valid, uh, they are really uh, transferable, non-transferable, sorry, they are really, how to say, fully credited because they were in a key chain of uh, digital validation. So that's the strength of it. But quite a lot of the people in the market really are not aware of that. So that's why I'm saying that we, you really need to focus on all of these aspects. And when you are looking at the evidence, this is, is coming to your question. You really need to be able to prove it through a partnership. I strongly believe, and this is something which also in the university and in the other associations in which I was working with in the last, in the last years, we try to showcase that if you really have partnership, you can really validate them because quality control especially in terms of micro certificates, comes from a trusted partnership. And that trusted partnership is not only digital, is also organizational. So we have this established partnership inside the universities, but also partnership with associations, with Eden, with IEEE, for example, for the deep tech or the digital content, with the Europe Action Culture for the digital culture courses, and so on. And plus, a strong partnership, as I said, with the open uh, educational technologies, with Moodle and several others, which are validating technically uh, these, uh, these uh, badges and certificates. Thank you, uh, Diana. Um, and I can see that uh, we got a question here, and I think uh, the Fulda University is part of uh, the UDRES Alliance. So, yes. <laughs> wave to the colleagues, please. Um, I was wondering, the, the question is, do you know uh, something about the German activities? Um, like, let's say, do you know something about the activities of one of the German partners in this alliance? Do you have information on this? Like, right now, or can you look it up? Maybe you can post something in the chat later. Yes, uh, Fulda, Fulda University is a new partner in our alliance. They joined in November, I think, 2022, and we are very happy with them. Uh, because they they met, uh, we met probably last time in November and then again in February and March in the task force. And uh, it's uh, Sophie, uh, I'll find her name soon, uh, which was really uh, working into this. And it's part of the task force of micro credentials. And they are not, as Mar Maria has said, some of the partners in the alliance are more ahead. Some of the partners of the alliance are learning from us and trying to establish the policies and the content. And, and uh, Fulda is trying to, to really do this uh, for the 2023-2024 academic year to really see how they can fully implement uh, this. They are quite a large university also like us. So it's not that easy to pass all the quality yeah. assurance system to be able to have a policy on micro-credentials and digital education when you are not really there because this is what I said, you have different levels. And I always encourage from my experience for the last 10 years, let's make it like that, but start small and grow slowly. Don't jump steps because then you create a lot of frustration among students, staff, academics, and the market cannot really understand. It. We started eight years ago with open badges have a policy, educate the, the market, educate the companies, educate the staff and the students to trust that the micro-credentials are validated and valid. And then you move 
to really embrace it and create it. And at this moment in the Youth Rest Alliance, we've been able to issue micro certificates for the I Living Labs, which are work done by students in groups in a very short time, but very intensive. Thank you. I mean, I can see some big nodding <laughs> from the other speakers here. So I would also like to give you a chance to respond to this topic. Perhaps uh, Martina, uh, I give you the word first. Yes, most definitely. I, I couldn't agree with, more with what Diana was saying, especially in the last part of they're not needing to be an institution reinventing the wheel for micro-credentials. Many education institutions have already been perhaps offering unique um, courses on the side that were not perhaps recognized and, and designed in a way um, to, 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 to be recognized also by employers. So it's about taking this, especially when the, the budget of the institution is not that great, when you have new people who new people to, to micro-credentialing, it's really important to, to have these inter internal discussions, look at the whole institutional strategy, you know, from who are you trying to address with this micro-credentials? How, how do our operations have to change? What governing policies as well need to be amended uh, for us to offer micro-credentials? What are the risks that we need to know about? Um, how, how are we going to determine success? How are we going to determine failure? Um, we, we've been also working with KIC on an opportunity analysis tool in a project, the MicroCredX project, um, where we are uh, primarily doing these workshops with uh, institutions to have these internal discussions and answer all of these questions to have a proper map that everyone is co uh, is comfortable with and confident with when, when implementing micro-credentials. Thank you for that response. I mean, Maria, uh, at the point where your alliance is now, I think it's uh, actually a very crucial uh, point within the university to have these discussions, as many attendees probably in this session are having as well in their institutions. What are your thoughts on this? There are so many domains to address, uh, from, from funding that we discussed, alignment with funding systems, to accreditation, to, uh, yeah, the, the, the institution positioning needs to be pretty comprehensive from, from these different aspects. What comes to trust and, and what kind of credentialing mechanisms we use. Um, now I want to remind you that the Alliance is now started working. So I'm not actually speaking on behalf of things that have already happened, just kind of brainstorming here, actually. But I've been thinking a little bit about... Uh, when you talk about educating the market, I get this in a way. I used to work before quite a bit with the joint degree programs, for example, Erasmus Mundus Joint Masters. And there you have kind of a concept that has existed for a long time. A student gets admitted to a Mundus program. Where they travel in many countries. And when they graduate, they get a certificate, a degree certificate that is signed by several institutions at once. You get, you get a joint degree. And I kind of realized as years passed by that employers are just from year to year, they're equally confused that what, what is this now? What, what, what does it mean that did you, did you do three different degrees or did you do it at once? That even if time passed by and even that this is a very known label within the universities, I don't think we never actually managed to educate the employers in a way. And what I found was crucial that the credential or the, the, the degree, the diploma that was granted, that it would ha have something that they trusted, meaning that the familiar university stamp is there or, or that there was some sort of familiarity. And I think whatever the solution is going to be for, for our alliance in terms of uh, for micro-credentials, it needs to come down to that we, uh, we try to align with the credentialing systems that the employers know that they can trust, that the students know and that they can trust, because otherwise it's a risky business, right? You, you don't have the time as an, uh, as an employer to go digging into that, what is this now? If you, if you see a familiar university stamp or a logo, or if they're familiar with open badges, that it makes sense. They don't have to examine the trustworthiness of it. And the same goes for the students, that when they take the micro-credentials, they need to be able to trust that this is recognized, this has a value. So I think we will kind of uh, discuss also this from the nine countries perspective and from the different nine environments we're operating in that what 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 is the mechanism that the market trusts in a way what is the what is the most effective medium for us to use with the credentialing 
Yeah, so common language and then discussing trust. Uh, these are really important issues with regards to micro-credentials. Uh, absolutely agree. So moving on to uh, our next round of questions, looking a bit towards the future. I mean, um, I'm really wondering because there's a big focus on this topic and uh, you can also see here from the people joining this session, there's like a great interest in, in them. Lots of events are happening around this topic and activities uh, within institutions and across institutions. Are we really uh, curious to hear, for instance, from you, Diana, um, what do you see really as the biggest challenges, but also the opportunities that micro-credentials in general as a topic face within maybe the next five, 10 years? So really looking ahead uh, at how this landscape uh, might evolve. And Martina, Maria, I'll ask you the same question because I think it's so broad, this topic, <laughs> that probably I'll get very different answers. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and just reminding everyone here joining the session, what, what do you think uh, are the biggest challenges and opportunities? Feel free to post them in the chat here and also uh, any questions that you might have because we'll have plenty of time for Q&A uh, at the end of this session and we'd love to hear from you as well. But over to you first, Diana. Yes, definitely. I, I quite see uh, we have a bit of potential here. You know, I'm an engineer at my basic formation, and I strongly believe that, uh, like in physics, you need to have momentum, and the momentum is now. So I used mm. to say that probably 2023 will be the year of my credentials because everybody is uh, speaking and looking at this and how this is running and, and how it's happening. But it's a long, long way ahead of us. As I said, uh, I've been seeing this for years, and I strongly believe in small steps uh, and, and getting it on board slowly. Because if you, uh, I don't believe too much, especially in the education sector, in big hypes or in, uh, in big worlds or something like this, I strongly believe that in education sector, trust is the most important uh, Thing which you need to have. And probably the first thing and the first challenge which I will see ahead of the micro credential is how to really build the trust, the trust networks between the learner, the employees, the education providers, and the society as, as general. And here, obviously, technology uh, speaks to itself and has a, a major role. Um, like open source technologies and certificates and validation of these certificates, moving, as I said uh, at the beginning of my, my intervention, on the European blockchain uh, services infrastructure of EPSI, where European Union has finally approved the, all the infrastructure and put the money on it because we really need to be able to have a public and open validation system at the European Union level which will implement and support all of this for a long term. Because uh, imagine that the certificate needs to be there 20, 50 years from now. Mm. So mm. it really needs to focus on long terms. And when we look at the technological developments, we don't know where we are going to be in 15 years from now. So we really need to be able to focus uh, quite a lot on the stability of the systems and how you can make it. That's one aspect. The other aspect, as I stress it, is the, 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 the market. You need to be able to make also the learners understand the value of the micro certificate, that they can have the flexibility of learning available to them, not only through open online learning or distance education, but also to other forms of education, which will deliver uh, a sort of uh, a, a skills um, competencies which after that are evaluated and can form a larger larger certificate or a larger evaluation of some competencies of, and so on. And this is really the future. I strongly believe also for traditional higher education because I'm coming from here. I don't want to speak about the, the training sector of the lifelong learning so much, but also in the traditional higher education, the sort of education which we've been doing for roughly the last 500 years or more precisely 300 years exactly like we are doing it now with full certificate full enrollment validation year, year, year after year and so on 
will not probably be here so much in 15 or 20 years from now. And because higher education is very slow responding, we need to be ready to, to focus on that and be able to do it. And European universities alliances and uh, multi-university campuses and, and joint uh, short modular degrees, which is the focus of several European universities alliances at this moment, is, I believe, uh, one step forward into that direction. Yeah, thank you, Diana. I mean, I hear you say at the one side, we have to take small steps, but on the other hand, we need to really think a vision. ahead and have a vision. Um, and I'm wondering, in your experience, do you see that it's a risk if a university now waits to see, like, let's say, to get more clarity? Or is it a good moment to take these small steps now? even if not everything is clear yet. What is your... I think you're asking the wrong person. I strongly <laughs> believe in early adopters <laughs> uh, because I strongly believe that progress in any form, it can happen only due to visionary and due to the persons or institution or groups of persons, communities, which really have the courage of moving forward and being the early adopter. I always encourage people to be an early adopter, to try, see the potential, see the challenges and the failures, then to be a laggard and stay until everybody's checking it and doing it and, and trying it there. And especially yeah. the education sector need to be more innovative than probably it is at this moment. But thank you, because I mean, I love this call to action. I mean, these are, this is also, I would say, the community of Hochschule Forum Digitalisierung is also uh, driving this kind of innovation often in their institution. So it's really good to hear that this is something, um, yeah, that that is encouraged and that that this, uh, yeah, moving forward <laughs> is key here. Um, Definitely. Yeah. And if I can add something, because you raised the bar to that, the European Digital Education Hub has a strong role on this if it can, how to say, um, gather and focus more the initiatives and the communities among this and encourage the early adapters that they are on the good path and that they should follow and not be discouraged. That's, uh, that's a strong point which uh, in the, uh, the European Digital Education Hub can, can have and a strong role. Yeah, thanks for mentioning this. Everyone uh, listening now, I'll, I'll put a link in the chat to this uh, great initiative of the European Commission. Uh, it's a hub for education professionals all around Europe. It's free to register. They have lots of interesting events. And most of all, it's a very important peer learning network, I would say. Mm. Um, just to remind you uh, of my question, which I'm, I'm also curious, Martina, what you would say, what do you see as the biggest challenges and opportunities facing micro-credentials in the next years and, and maybe even could you say something about how you think this landscape might evolve? Um, yeah, curious to hear from you. Yes, um, I think one of the biggest challenges is going to be um, avoiding a massive imbalance between what is happening at the policy level versus what is happening at the institutional level to implement micro-credentialing. If you have various institutions in a country working their butts off to develop micro-credentials, but at the policy level, uh, micro-credentials haven't been incorporated into, into the national qualifications framework, or there is no financial support and inv in investment to advance technologies as well. Um, there's, uh, there's going to be a gap, and there, there needs to be um, there needs to be a whole system approach. This we have also discussed in, in the previous question. Um, one very good example that. Uh, I've seen so far in the research I've been doing, at least within Europe, is the Irish National Qualifications Framework. Um, but from this research, I see that Europe is moving a bit slower. Uh, you have, for example, New Zealand and Australia really pushing in this regard. Um, so 
uh, although although you have to keep in mind as well that when you're working with bigger countries, then <laughs> it's uh, it's more of a push that needs needs to happen when you have so many institutions. Because again, even if you do have from the policy level uh, the support that's necessary at the institution level, you can have so many nuances that are that are coming up. You can have a leadership that yes wants mm-hmm. uh, micro credentialing, but. Uh, at, at, at the lower levels, then perhaps at the admissions office, they're not recognizing them for entry into, into the study programs. Uh, or the, the low quality of the micro credentials being offered is risking then the reputation and the budget of the institution. So it's really trying to understand what trust is necessary and balancing um, the, the, the policy level and the, the institutional level support that is necessary within the specific context. And as you mentioned, IDEH, the European Digital Education Hub, we just need to continuously be having spaces where people are coming and, and uh, sharing the, the experiences that, that worked for them, other experiences that, that haven't worked for them. Um, because it's in these spaces where you would figure out, ah, I see uh, this is, a, this is a, a method that we haven't tried yet. And it can also keep the, the wave, so I say the trend of micro-credentialing alive before another EU policy trend comes up. And then that uh, dimish, diminishes the importance of the disruptive force that, that micro-credentialing does have to reform and make our education systems more flexible and responsive. Indeed. Yeah, I now see a response from Martin Staudinger that he's writing uh, as a small distance university in Austria. They, they issued their own certificates first and are, are now in the process or wishing to switch to European digital credentials. I mean, I can imagine that this is um, a big uh, investigation uh, first, perhaps, on how and why exactly uh, to do this. So I'd be interested also to hear more from you, Martin, but uh, let's first uh, move to Maria. um, And then afterwards, the speakers also all have a chance to respond to each other. And uh, any other questions or comments, please post them here in the chat. But Maria, um, with regards to the future of micro-credentials, you might have really great hopes uh, for it with your Mm. alliance, but at the same time, Mm. I can see and hear from you that you want to approach in a very pragmatic, realistic way as well. So mm. how, what do you hope for? Let's put it like this, mm. Mm. <laughs> for the future mm. of micro-credentials. Mm. I, I, I actually would like to raise the, the hopes and expectations, but also this but side, but I'll, I'll start with the positives. Um, I just really hope that universities just dare to give micro-credentials a try. I think, Martina, what you said about the different institutional levels is really important. So when when kind of I look at it, this what I mentioned at the start about bridging, that you bridge the international uh, level with the uh, national and institutional, but so much happens also within the institution itself. What are the what is the orientation and challenges within the different administrative units, within the faculties, uh, by the leadership? So there is there is just the institutional position itself is demanding work. But regardless of this, there are so many benefits in terms of accessibility, lowering the threshold to participate to education, added flexibility to gain your knowledge. So I really think that micro-credentials play a crucial role in getting more folks in education and completing their education as it's more flexibly designed. So that's really good. New types of partnerships would evolve, uh, in my opinion, as a result of micro-credentials uh, and, and university uh, collaboration with the work life. And that it enables, as mentioned, a new fast track for transferring the research outputs into education. So those are the kind of benefits that I don't that I think will endure time. We will see the results later on. But I really hope, as said, that universities grasp this possibility to make education more attainable. But, and this is not actually a concrete but, but I think that I've been starting to think, actually. Um, I, I guess we all have read news or research papers about the constantly shrinking attention span that we have. So I believe that it was like 20 years ago, the, the average time that we'd stay focused uh, on a screen was like two and a half minutes. And now it's something like 47 seconds. So we have a trend that we everything is shorter more easier to chew, that we make it kind of um, more digestible all the time. 
And uh, although I work in Norway, I'm originally Finnish, and therefore I follow the Finnish debates and news a lot. And recently there has been an intensive discussion about the decline of learning results in Finnish schools. In the school system that has been ranked as one of the best in the world for a long time, but now there is a kind of a, a negative trend. And many teachers believe that the digital shift and the ever shortening attention spam contributes to this. So while I like that the micro-credentials really add possibilities in terms of better access and flexibility, at the same time, I cannot really help but reflect that are we actually contributing to this trend where everything is becoming shorter, faster, easier to choose, and then you kind of move on. And I guess the concern I'm I'm having is that if qualifications get shorter, does it mean that we start thinking smaller too? Is it that it's the larger time-consuming projects for a student like a master thesis or a well-designed learning pathway that takes for years that really build the thinking skills where you position the micro-credentials? From this perspective, I think the stackability of micro-credentials is such a crucial element that I think needs to be really carefully considered that each micro-credential you take can be added on. You can, you can build the learning pathway and help yourself understanding the bigger picture and not just the small learning units so that we actually do kind of continue to have some sort of a framework for thinking that, that we do need for these big challenges we as humanity and, and the world are facing. So this is kind of my big but. <laughs> but I think there are also solutions in terms of stackability. And I, I think degrees will not vanish anywhere. It's more about how do these two complement one another. These are, uh, I think, great hopes from all three of you and also realistic points that everyone uh, probably is considering right now. Um, we still have, of course, time to now please Martina, <laughs> to, to respond to each other and uh, yeah. um, take some more questions as well. What, what would you like to contribute? If I can, if I can uh, just add on to what Maria was saying, because I fully support it indeed. And I'll say from my own personal experience, I'm, I'm a food scientist by my studies, um, food and, and biomedical scientist, but I'm working in education policy. And I got into that because of the work I did as a student representative at the uh, national level in Malta and then with the European Students' Union. That was uh, informal learning, I guess you can call it. Mm -hmm. um, should I ever wish to advance my studies, perhaps on food policy, um, I hope that I would be able to use also the experience that I gained uh, as part of uh, an application process and also to stack it together. I mean, the Europass CV, has been instrumental, especially for me, to communicate uh, the the work that I've done in these mm. student organizations. Um, for example, I would have not considered, had I written my own CV uh, without having a format such as Europass, I wouldn't have considered to write, for example, the events that I was going to um, during during my time in student organizations, what I learned from that, the amount of publications uh, that I contributed to. Uh, or perhaps I would have, but the format that it would have been written in would have been uh, all over the place. Whereas with Europass, you have a clear um, standard format that employers can look at and, and use this uh, as part of your recognition to, 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 to gain access to employment. So fully, fully uh, support what, what you, you've been saying, Maria, and uh, this, these notes as well were made by Diana about the importance of digital credentials um, and the future for, for younger generations who wish to take on, uh, as I said, um, more tra transverse, uh, more, more uh, diverse sort of uh, learning pathways. Indeed. Diana, how? I can see you thinking. <laughs> Yes, I'm thinking because uh, uh, you somehow uh, made me think. Um, I'm obviously much older here. <laughs> uh, I've been educated. Uh, in fact, I'm celebrating 30 years since my bachelor's degree uh, graduation uh, next week. So <laughs> many, many years ago. So it's a, it's a world when, when we were not thinking about this. Uh, I, I developed my first uh, web uh, page. Uh, and as a, how to say, as a young, uh, almost finished in my diploma thesis when I was graduating Bachelor of Sciences, and it was very, very new on the market. But 
I have degrees for, uh, from three different countries, in fact. <laughs> and uh, I've been working and, and traveling all over the world. And quite a lot in the, in the last years, I've been asking myself how I can prove this. Uh, mm. Because obviously, you can say it, you can put it in your CV, but how I can really prove it? How I can really show somebody who is new, young, what I've done 20, 25 years ago and how that shaped more or less quite a lot of the way of how I'm approaching even technology probably, but more precisely strategy development and organizational culture because that's something which us as computer scientists and engineers, we've never been discussing until very recently. And this is something which I learned along the pathway and how you can put that as a strength or a competence. So that's why um, I strongly started working with also open badges and certificates and validation because I really believe that we need to be able to evaluate, assess, and implement in Europass. Obviously, I strongly believe in that and validate it through all the frameworks like digital competencies framework, the European, the the Bcomp Edu in education the entrepreneurship competencies and a lot of other frameworks which we have. And at the end of the day, to be really putting it into a format which will make it easy to understand for the market, but also for anybody else who really wants to, to be able to learn how to do it. I mentor several young people, either PhD students, master students or something like that, on how to build up their career and how to keep evidence of what they are doing and how they are doing it. And that's probably something which we keep discussing in probably the last 20 years about portfolios. But a portfolio is not easy to be implemented and show to the market if you don't really have a structure for it. So I fully believe that Europlus and all of these micro-credentials, which is probably just a, a, a new digital and interesting way of showcasing in fact, uh, what your experience and competencies are. Mm, something important to, to yeah, keep closely connected with in that sense. So we still have a couple of minutes left. I don't see any specific questions at the moment, but I actually have another one. I was, I was wondering because, um, Diana, you mentioned it already, uh, the word market, and we talked about partnerships and collaboration. I was wondering if, if any of you have an idea or suggestions for universities thinking about branding of micro-credentials because in some way it's also a great business opportunity for universities. Uh, I was wondering if someone would like to comment on that, it would be great. Um, I can say something quickly and then I'll leave also the others. Uh, the United States universities and companies have been the first ones which really put it branding into into the market of open and digital online learning when they built the massive open online courses uh, badges and then micro specializations. They joined forces, two, one, three companies, uh, big names of companies with two, three universities plus a platform provider. So I believe that's the partnership where we are looking into in the future to have big companies or how to say association of companies or chambers of commerce or any entities which will put also the community or the regional development up front, plus a partnership of universities. European University Alliance is one model, can exist any other models, and then strong platform. I strongly believe that it's the time of having small uh, piloting way, as my colleagues from Austria have been mentioning, that they issue the certificates into their own system. Fine, we've been doing that in the last, as I said, eight years. But two, three years ago, we've been thinking, we need a lab, larger platform. You have the mobility of your graduates. You really need to be able to, to allow them to bring their certificates with them and showcase them and bring them into another country, into another system, and so on. So that's something where we really need to be strongly having a strong partnership. So I see these three bits jointly working together. Thank you. I also see that uh, actually in the same time that I posed my question, a comment came in from uh, Dagmar Butker, 
who is saying, um, well, everyone can read it here, <laughs> but the, the opportunities um, and the learning market for people in Europe and people maybe also who don't have access to academics, that's also part of this marketing strategy overall, I think, um, or could be um, for universities. Um, Maria, Martina, um, still mm -hmm. a couple of minutes left. The short response would be great from your side. Yes, um, if I can, because I've actually been researching this as well on us too. And I've seen with, with some European university alliances, they're, they're um, marketing them, mark, micro-credentials as project-based learning. So the assessment that you would have is, is through a project-based uh, assessment. I think that's one of the things that um, students nowadays, rather than sitting in an exam or, or having to submit a written uh, test, uh, that that more simulation with uh, on on project uh, through work based experience can be quite well relevant as well for the labor market. Uh, that aside from mentioning the skills, competencies, and learning outcomes that a learner can acquire by taking the micro credentials, that you also mentioned perhaps learning and career pathways that can can be opened up. And one thing that so far I don't see that much about is uh, student feedback on the platforms themselves uh, where you've uh, you've asked students for feedback who are, who took the courses and that you publish that feedback or perhaps also how the quality assurance um, is organized that students can take part in that as well. I think that is also uh, an, an attractive point, but definitely the accessibility of these offers for people who are not so conventionally involved uh, who, to non-conventional learners is something that also requires uh, extra extra thoughts and perhaps also piloting with these this, these target groups. Mm -hmm. Maria, how do you see this? I saw you taking some notes. Oh, yeah. I, I actually want to convert from branding to externals to branding to internals. As we discussed briefly previously, is that there... You know, universities exist to do research and offer research-based education. So that's the kind of everyday reality for for a scientific staff member at a university. So micro-credential in that it's it's another new term. It's another new task amongst a gazillion tasks. So so for us to how how do we actually make folks engaged? How do we actually prove the value and market and brand them internally so that we have a collective enthusiasm and understanding about the possibilities they bring is, I think, at least as important than the external branding. Um, folks do things when they see the relevance of it. But if the relevance is that EU tells us to do this and we got funding for it, it's not good enough. So the institutional motivation at all levels and the internal branding of it is extremely important. Communication of a clear value and benefits. Well, that is some food for thought, I think, <laughs> and also a call to action uh, for everyone joining this session um, to, that, that we will be closing with. Um, I would really like to thank very much our, our speakers here. Also, thank you, the audience, for uh, your comments and questions. And uh, we are looking forward to keeping in touch. Um, thanks again very much for contributing to the University Future Festival. Uh, very important topic for our half day uh, micro-credentials and our community. So thank you for your thoughts on this topic. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. I will close the session. I will send everyone back to the lobby, um, but we'll keep in touch uh, via the event platform. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. -bye. <laughs> Bye, -bye. Thank you.